So we, we're doing really kind of two weeks of introduction up to the launch of the Forgiving Challenge. And the books are in the foyer. They're available to you. We'll have them next week and the following week as well. Uh, but we really commend that to you. It's, there's a great value in a congregation doing this kind of together at the same time. So we're offering uh, Bible studies on Sunday to introduce the week's stuff. So that happens too. So all those things happen. And here's the thing. It's about a pillar. This is one of those key pillars, who we are in Christ, and then we're going to go to forgiving and talk about why forgiveness is such a pillar in the words of Jesus as we look at our faith. Um, but today I want to review being. Um, I just want to keep reviewing what we've done so that we can do this launch. Um, you know, when the Olympics, I don't know how many of you followed the Olympics, I was not nearly as as rabid or passionate about it this year for some reason. I don't know, we had building projects or things going on. But I wasn't quite as passionate, but there were certain things which really caught my eye. And uh, one of them, boy, one was Sydney, what was her name? McLaughlin, she, what a, the hurdler broke the world record. That was amazing. So cool to watch. And swimmers, Katie Ledecky, I mean, I don't think she'll ever get old. Um, so it's kind of, kind of, there's some amazing stories in there. But one of them was uh, basketball both men's and women's. Um, the men's one was not nearly as controversial, and I didn't follow it as closely, but I'd be scrolling through my ESPN app, and I'd see an article on it and read a little bit about it. But, you know, and if you don't follow basketball, please forgive me. Steph Curry was on the team, and Steph Curry is probably getting towards the end of his career, um, but boy, there was, a, there was a time when he was absolutely the most prolific scorer I mean, if you needed 10 points in two minutes, you brought him in and he just poured in the basket. I mean, amazing shooter, just amazing. And he wasn't playing much. They were not playing. Well, that was the story. And I'm sitting there saying, and I didn't know the whole context. I didn't know everything. But I'm going, why would you have that guy on the bench? Now, obviously, he must not have been performed. I guess he got his act together and really became a key to us winning, uh, winning the gold medal. But I asked the question, why would you put this guy who has proven himself for so long, and you had him on the team, what's he doing on the bench? And the other one was Caitlin Clark. You know that name? So Caitlin Clark, the gal who led like Iowa to women's college championship. They lost, but led, her, led him to that. And then she was the first pick for the WNBA. And then there's, been, there's just been some kind of controversy about it. And she didn't make the Olympic team, didn't even get a tryout or anything. And it's interesting because she's kind of revolutionized interest and in how the game has been perceived. A fascinating thing. I was just reading articles. And I just sat there and I said, why would you leave her off the team? I just was surprised. I just, and I don't know. I'm, I'm making no political statements here at all, just so you know. I just, basketball. I like to win. Um... I remember went to, a, I can't remember if it was Portland or here. I think it was in Portland, now that I think about it. Went to a Blazers game, and the only reason I went to the Portland Trail Blazers game was because uh, Michael Jordan was going to be there with the Bulls. It was back when he was probably the best, maybe the best athlete I've ever seen in my life. Just an astonishing in-person, in-person kind of thing. And I remember, you know, everyone's excited to see him, and he doesn't play. In the first half, he doesn't play. And, you know, you're sitting there going, I want my money back. And I'm thinking, if I'm the Chicago Bulls coach, I'm going, what's that dude sitting on the bench? Well, he had kind of tweaked a muscle in warm-ups, and so they were being careful with him and all that kind of thing. But that's the question that comes to my mind. If you have a guy like that, why don't you put it into play? Here's the deal with the Red Letter Challenge. There's these five pillars why don't you put him into play? And so the one is, what we're going to talk about today, the one pillar which is so key is who are you? And how can you find out? And this is the weirdest thing. I, was saying, I said this in the first service. I waited until much later in the service to say as parents, I think there's a tremendous gift you give your kids. Christian parents can do this for their kids. Remind them who they are. All the time. Not just that you love them. Just remind them what a treasured possession they are of God. That in their baptism, God put his name on them and said, this is where the treasure lies. X marks the spot. Point to crosses and tell them how valuable they are. I mean, over and over. And you know what, parents? You know what that does? It reminds you too. 
And so who we are is such a key pillar. But how do you figure it out? Because in the culture we live today, it's a lot of navel-gazing and self-assessments and tests and things that you take so that you can find out who you are from within. And, and here's the thing. I don't mean to be kind of a Debbie Downer or anything like that, but we're broken. We just confessed it. And so our self-analysis is going to be somewhat broken. And therefore, I need to hear what God says. And that's this pillar. Who are we? And we discover who we are when we discover who he is. And so the thing is, and how do you discover things about a person? You know, people talk and talk and talk. I have to laugh about this in politics. We're in this frantic, it's horrible. And it's just yelling, a lot of yelling. And, uh, and people say things. How many of you go, I don't know if I believe that. Anybody? Or do you go, oh, that's amazing. Let me write them a check. I mean, I sit there and I go, I don't, I don't think I believe you. So it's an interesting thing when we go to Jesus and say, not just what you say, what does he do? So what Pastor Zender did with this study was he said, what were the habits of Jesus? What did he do? So this is not Jesus just from on high saying to you, you better do this. Do these five things and you'll... And again, I never want you to walk out of a sermon feeling that way. That you went out and said, oh, I'm a bad Christian. I better do these five things or I stink. We want you to say, what a great Jesus we have. Look at what Jesus did. And so these are the five habits of Jesus that he models for us. And so I want to be able to chat about that with you. If you follow along on the outline at all, that's where we're going, is asking the question, who are we because of who he is? And how do we know is because of what Jesus did. His doing arose out of his being. Who he was for us, the incarnate Son of God, God in the flesh, in our midst, our Redeemer, our Savior, the sacrificial lamb, the scapegoat, the one who took our place, the one who dares to call us friends and who gives us a high and noble task, empowers us with the gospel. I mean, this is who he is. So what are the habits? And here it is. And what I wanted to do was to take that epistle reading. Thanks, Ruth, for reading scripture. And so we took that epistle reading. And, you know, this is another one of those verses that Lutherans kind of claim to ourselves because it talks about the priesthood of all believers. We're not a church that says... Oh, the pastor's like the Pope, and I have to do whatever he says. In fact, to be honest, it would be nice if you did some of the things I said. Um, but, it was, but seriously, we're a bottom-up, not a top-down kind of place. And so we love this passage where Peter is saying to the people of God, you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people dedicated to God. Once you were not a people, now you're the people of God. That's a cool thing. That's a who are you thing. But it begins with who he is. As you come to him, and forgive me, I'm going to read this again. Not the whole thing. As you come to him, Jesus Christ, the living stone. And I love that image because a living stone infects all the other stones around it. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. He's the living stone, the foundation, the rock, the life. He's the one who brought you life when there was no life. That's who he is. And so what were the habits of the living stone? And here, here's how it goes. The first one is about community. Commit to community. Jesus immediately creates community, doesn't he? He immediately calls disciples to himself. And you know, it's interesting because we often think, if I mention that to you, you say, oh yeah, he had the 12 disciples. And one of them was kind of a real loser, and so he got stuck with 11. And so that's a small community. Well, if you're reading the New Testament faithfully, you discover there were other members of his community too, weren't there? There was a whole group of donors, women especially, but probably Lazarus included in that, 
who contributed to, the, to his ministry, supported the ministry. So in fact, then we get a second number. There's 12, then there's 30. That's another number that's mentioned. And then there's another number. You know which one, what it is? 72. Remember that? He sent 72 out to proclaim the gospel and say the kingdom of God is near. 72. Now they're not named for us, but it clearly is a community that Jesus entrusted the message of reconciliation and of repentance and peace, right? So there's 72. And then we get this next number, 500 eyewitnesses of the risen Lord. So there's this whole community that Jesus is building. He commits to that. It's not like he says, you guys go out and form a community. You guys go camping for the next three and a half years. I'm staying at the Radisson. He is with them in community. And you know, I want to just say, if you're watching online, praise God, we are honored that you would join us online. And there's uh, folks in nursing homes that we just love to bless. And for many people, it's very chilly in here. Is it very chilly in here? You're okay? Okay. Feels chilly to me. If it's 69 or 8, Jared, you're not allowed to mess with the thermostat. <laughs> Dude, I'm freezing up here. Anyway, is there an elder here? I'm freezing up here, I said. <laughs> um, no, thanks. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah. If you're joining us online, we're delighted. And, and you know what's funny is I have colleagues, other pastors, who have decided we're not doing that anymore because we want people to come back to church. So we're not making it possible. We're not going to do that. And I said, I disagree with you. We're going to always do it. Because really, we love blessing our shut-in people, our people who can't come, people in nursing homes. We've got services going in two, sometimes three nursing homes with our stream. We're down in Soda Springs, blessing that little congregation down there. I hope we bless them um, by streaming services there. And then we have people who are traveling or who are ill or whatever. And that's great. We love it. We love that that's a thing. But I got to say, this is better. If you can be here, this is better. And the reason is, is because it's community. And we do this together. We journey together. This is not just a me and Jesus thing. We, Jesus created the community for us to journey together in that way. And so um, it's interesting because in the Being Challenged, Pastor Zender talks about habits. Do you know how many days it takes to form a habit, a lifelong habit, long-term habit? 66 days. Not just a quick habit. I mean, a habit that persists. 66 days. How long has it been from the pandemic? It's very tempting, right? Pajamas and a cup of coffee. That's kind of, that's kind of convenient, isn't it? It's kind of nice. And I don't begrudge that. Seriously, I don't. Um, I talked with a bunch of pastors all of our pet leaders last week in Portland, there were about 30 of us in all the different regions in four states. And we were talking uh, about long-term effects of the pandemic. You know what's interesting? We've, we still have not gotten back to what attendance was before the pandemic in 2019. Because we were like 450 in worship. Now we're like right at 400. So we're still, we're still down by like 15%, something like that. And uh, it's interesting, and all of them said the same thing, because I said, you know who I'm not seeing? Were the people that would come every like six, seven, or eight weeks. That doesn't seem very often, but I would see them four or five times a year, not just Christmas and Easter. And you know, when I was in my 20s, I would be more snarky. Hey, you need to be here. Because this is what people always say to me. I'll see him in Fred Meyer or something. Oh, it's great to see you. And they'll say, oh, we should be at church. And I go, yes, that would be awesome. But no one's keeping score. No one's keeping score. But we think it would bless you, and we'd love to be together. We're less without you, and we're greater when you're there. So that's the community. I, and, I, and what I should now add is, and Jesus modeled it for us. That was Jesus' habit. His habit was to commit to community. It's interesting to me when we think about it, What's one, and I wish, whenever I mention this, I always wish we, could, we were doing communion today. But when we come to the table, that's community. You know communion, when we do it here, is such a high and holy thing. We want people to come, right? Jesus wants people to come. Jesus says, I have eagerly desired to have this meal with you. 
But it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Do you know why? Because it's not just about you and Jesus. It's also about the people who are kneeling next to you. You don't, you're not in charge of their souls. You're not keeping score with them, God forbid. But it's us shoulder to shoulder, arm in arm, weird and different as we are, with all our histories and all our needs, and Jesus knows them all and still brings us his body and blood. That's a big deal. God to us and us to one another. That's the community Jesus formed. How wonderful that the symbol of Christianity is a cross. Heaven to earth, brother and sister to each other. The second one is this, is the study of Scripture. This is a pillar. Who are we? Who are we? Because in Scripture we hear words like this. This is not a call to, oh, you better faithfully work through the Greek and the Hebrew and work through all the... Scripture will tell you things about yourself. You want a bio? Like I'm, I'm now starting to reach out to potential pastors because my role is going to change in like a year and a half. It's going to change. I'm not dying. I keep telling people. We're not dying. We're not moving away. But my role is going to change. I'm, you know, I'm getting a little tired. So, you know, things go this way. Just change a little bit. But I'm starting to reach out to guys. And you know what you look for? You're looking for a bio. Tell me your story, your journey, your spiritual journey. Who have you served? Where'd you go to school? What's about your family? You know, your faith journey and all those things. You get kind of a bio in, in our profession, in our world. As we look at that and look at potential candidates who might be a good fit for the kind of ministry that we have here. You, you know what? You want your bio? Study scripture. Because in the word, you're going to hear words like this, where Jesus says, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to bear fruit in my name. I no longer call you servants, but I call you my friends. Paul says this, you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And St. John tells us, he says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. That truth isn't found within us. It's declared to us by God. You want to find out God's bio? Get in the Word. Because in finding out God's bio, you're going to find out what He says about you. He's, brutal. He's awfully honest. But he is, he is wonderfully gracious and lavish in the outpouring of His gifts. Third thing is this. Prioritize prayer. You know, it's, it always astonishes me. Jesus does not need to pray, and yet does it all the time. Just does it so constantly. It has to be that he is saying, please take note. Please see what I'm doing. And you know, it's fun because the di disciples listen in on him periodically. That's how we get the Lord's Prayer, right? You know, when they go to him and they say, hey, Jesus, teach us to pray. Like these devout Jewish dudes didn't know how to pray. They had all kinds of prayers. They said, no, we want to pray like you. And so he says, say Abba, say Father. He's modeling. He's showing. And in Jesus' incarnation, in the incarnation of God, God humbled himself so far. We can't imagine how God humbled himself. You, can we? You can't imagine it. I mean, the difference between me and a newborn is a big gulf, intellectually, age-wise. You think the gulf between us and God is, what do you think? A little more? And so God's humbling of himself into human form to know how desperately he needed not just this one, but the next one, seeking solitude, was he was modeling that if even the Lord of the universe desires and needs that, who are we to think that we don't? And so it's interesting. I love this one on prioritizing prayer because Jesus prays for you. Jesus prays for you. You are on his heart. You are on his mind. Jesus prays for us for protection. He prays for provision. He prays that we would rely on his promises. He prays for unity for us. 
and to the life that has the fullness of joy. I came that they might have life and have it to the fullness. To encourage us, to give hope, to pour out grace and mercy, to give us his body and blood that we might know for sure that our sins are forgiven. All these things Jesus prays for on your behalf and invites you to join him. The fourth one is seeking solitude. I find that fascinating. And you know what I think is the biggest reason for this? And this tells me that Jesus spans all eras and times. In Jesus' day, what I hear when I talk to anthropologists or historians, one of the things they speculate about is how quiet the world would have been in the days of Jesus. No sirens, no phones, no automobiles. Imagine fishing on the Sea of Galilee. The noise. And I th- this tells me that Jesus knew that in our era, this is a big deal. To go to a place where the angry, confusing, conflicted voices of today are not shouting at you, but a place in which God himself in Christ can comfort you and speak to you. I always bring my Bible with me in times of prayer, always. Because I, if, if I run out of words, he's got plenty. And so God can speak those words of grace to me. Jesus models this to diminish those voices so that God might speak into it. And the last thing is this, choose church. And it's intriguing to me because you know why this is so important? I did a funeral <clears throat> yesterday. Oops. Um, Eleanor Medley, she was 92. Should I cry about that? Her dear husband, Ken, who I've, we spend a lot of time singing the choir, and he helps me with building projects. And in fact, I see him a lot because he's in the Navy, he's in the Honor Guard, so I see him every time there's military honors at the funeral and here in Pocatello at the cemetery. And I stopped and began the service yesterday just to say thank you to him for how he and Eleanor, they would walk slowly in and sit right there, Susan, where you and Glenn, because Ken would sing in the choir and she'd sit right there. And I just said, thank you for modeling that for me, what that looks like. Faithful husband, faithful wife, Uh, the two become one flesh. God wasn't joking wasn't easy always. Anyone who's been married knows that's the case. Not always easy to live that out. But God was faithful. I just think sometimes we, we need to remember our members who teach us those things. Because this is, what, this is why I choose church. You know why? What's Jesus' term for the church? His bride. Choose your bride. Choose the bride of Christ because it is, the, it is his beloved. We are his beloved. It's not an institution, goodness gracious, with budgets and building programs. That's dumb. It's the collection of God's people. And there's not many places in this world where you are absolutely the focus of love. In this place you are. His focus is on you as his beloved. That's who we are. Because that's who he is. To God be the glory. Amen.